Chapter Three, Part One of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Woman's Experiences in Venezuela. The doings of the creatures in fur, feathers, and scales kept us keenly interested from morning to night yet in our wilderness search there were many unnatural history experiences some disagreeable others thrilling but all so wholly delightful in their charm of strangeness to the woman who enjoyed them that the picture of our wilderness seems incomplete without them life on board a venezuelan sloop is quite unlike any other experience in the world neither the woman who sits under the awning of a luxurious yacht nor her more adventurous sister who sails her own catboat over turbulent waters can form any idea of the daily life aboard such a craft the night we set forth in our tiny sloop from the island of trinidad headed for an unexplored part of the orinoco delta it was hard to realize that we were at last bound for south america the land of our dreams as you know we were for the present owners of a sloop flying the venezuelan flag and manned by five men of whom only the captain knew a word of english the charm of exploration and adventure laid a spell upon us both el senor naturalista and me and we watched in silence the sunset sky and the dim receding shores of trinidad but there was a certain stern reality about that first night aboard the josefa jacinta that soon broke in upon our reveries when we descended to the tiny cabin to unpack the sloop had begun to pitch heavily and we set ourselves to solve the problems of unstable equilibrium which constantly shifting angles of thirty to forty degrees presented in both floor and walls by courtesy we called our domicile a cabin and we found that it would hold two people at a pinch we unearthed our unused pneumatic mattresses and rigged up our gilded foot pump for fifteen minutes william worked then the mate was called and took a hand were we on a sinking ship and manning the pumps for our lives greater exertions could not have been made and the reward was a thin film of air within the rubber bed then we unscrewed the decorative but useless contrivance and william began to blow this proved effective and in a few minutes we had placed the soft air-filled cushions in our respective bunks we dubbed these bunks catacombs at once for the tiny niches into which we later crept were more like the vaults of a tomb than aught else i doubt if either of us will ever forget that first night beneath the flooring and behind the planked sides of the vessel was a mysterious underworld densely populated by rats of a most sportive disposition how they managed to live there we never discovered for we neither caught sight of one throughout the voyage nor were we ever troubled by raids on biscuits or other edibles there seemed to be some kind of a running track extending around the hidden depths of the sloop a race would start near the stern the contestants tearing around william's bunk then the footfalls would die out toward the bow to become audible almost at once on my side a medley of sound indicating a mob of invisible rushing creatures galloping down a mysterious home stretch for some time we expected the goal of each race to be some part of ourselves or our luggage but the heat would invariably end on the under side of the partition within a few inches of my ear and then would follow a general melee and fight punctuated with shrill squeaks and squeals 
and vicious blows and sounds of tumbling rolling bodies were we in the mood we might have learned much of rat vocabulary but we did not know then that these strenuous rodents never penetrated to the upper portions of the sloop and this uncertainty kept alive our interest in their maneuvers throughout the night silence was unknown during this first night and while the rats were resting other things occupied our mind and kept away ennui and sleep the gurgle and splash of bilge water was a steady accompaniment of the pitch and toss of the sloop while now and then a sinister trickling came to our ears we called up to the captain and inquired about it and were assured that it was only a leak he had looked for it many times but could not locate it this gave us food for thought besides adding decidedly to the slowness of the ticking of the watch marking the passage of the hours of darkness i lay in my berth as long as i could endure it dreaming now and then of being buried alive then rising with a start and striking my head against the coffin lid of my catacomb at last i abandoned it for the floor of the cabin sloping and under five feet in total length though it was i found it was better to be huddled in a forlorn little bundle on the floor than in that hole which by no stretch of the imagination could be called a berth overhead the crew worked fitfully all night long i could move the hatch curtain look up and see the sturdy old captain with his hand on the rudder a picture which was to become familiar to us through many nights what a picturesque old figure he was rugged and stern yet as gentle and courteous as any gentleman of the old school and bearing his threescore and eight years with wonderful vigor now and then his deep voice would rise above the roar of wind and waves in hoarse commands in spanish to the crew then he would push the rudder hard up the boom would swing over with a jerk which made the whole sloop tremble and a wave would wash over the deck and send a trickle of cold drops down upon my face smothered exclamations from the crew and the sound of their bare feet splashing along the deck would end the audible part of the maneuver then i would shift to meet the new angle of the floor and wait for the next race of the rats now and then the captain would reach behind the hatch curtain for his watch and examine its dripping face by the light of the candle in the compass box faltan las cinco a la una he would mutter and i knew that midnight had passed and that somewhere in our wake morning was on its way to end this night of nights the tempest increased and tossed our sloop like a flying leaf sometimes it seemed as if we never would right ourselves after heeling far over into the depths but the calm face of our helmsman dispelled all uneasiness and i lay staring into the darkness feeling myself the veriest atom amid this fierce tumult to this moment i cannot tell how long it took us to get from trinidad to venezuela across the awful gulf of paria to me it seemed an endless space of time day succeeding night with choppy seas ominous noises in the pitching cabin hot sleepy hours on deck in the shade of the sail with the great green waves forever rolling after and breaking partly over us by the captain's reckoning however it was the noon of only the second day which revealed the distant shore and soon we forgot all the discomforts of the past hours in the wonderful beauty of the scene before us the still brassy waters and the rich green mangroves entering the wide caño san juan we dropped anchor in the lee of a solitary guard ship a poor derelict a rusty and worn-out freighter 
whose last days were to be spent here in the calm waters at the edge of the mangrove forest our little sloop was soon overrun with young custom house officials from the guard ship curious but courteous and far more appreciative of the stiff rounds of rum which our captain willingly served to them under our direction than of our gilt sealed letters of introduction if we would but take their photographs on board the ponton they would row us close along the shore while we waited for the fulling tide as the captain called it of course we agreed shouldering their rusty muskets they stood in a row to be photographed young inexperienced boys whose idle days on the derelict were spent in drinking smoking cigarettes and lying in hammocks playing the mandolin watching for the rare sloop or schooner which might enter venezuela by this desolate and unfrequented cano we promised to send them the pictures but captain trujillo said afterwards with a sad shake of his head that they would have lost their positions long before the pictures could reach them no one ever stayed long there was always someone to carry reports to castro of treachery and plotting and there would be new faces on the ponton to stay a little while and then to disappear like their predecessors now for many days the sloop was our home and the innumerable gleaming canos of the delta our highways by day we explored the mangroves in our curiara or dugout and by night we slept the dreamless sleep of healthful outdoor life safe from the persecution of the humming anopheles outside our netting on the after deck when midday heat or sudden rain drove the wild creatures from our view i studied our motley crew and found them a never failing source of entertainment the tally of the crew must begin with philo the mate a huge black creole speaking spanish besides his own strange vernacular then there were two sailors from the island of margarita and antonio cook by profession admitting some dutch blood but of unknown extraction and decidedly uncertain disposition the cook on board a venezuelan craft is always given the respectful title of maestro so maestro he always was to us maestro as an individual was an interesting psychological study although he probably never heard of such a thing as a labor union yet he was the embodied spirit of one he declared in terms that left no possibility of misunderstanding that he was cook not sailor and that he would do nothing but cook he would cook cheerfully over a stove that smoked like dante's inferno but when called upon in an emergency to help hoist a sail he would fly into a violent torrent of angry spanish later when the temper had spent itself he would often go and do what was asked of him i have seen many high tempers but never one that quite equaled maestros there were times when he would draw his huge cutlass or machete on the captain for a long time these were all false alarms but at last maestro threatened once too often and so seriously that he was discharged on the spot and left marooned in a little indian village with no means of returning to trinidad but this was at the end of our voyage maestro in his patched and faded shirt with sleeves rolled to the elbow still more patched trousers rolled to the knee bare as to feet crownless hat on one side of his head an ancient and odiferous pipe hanging from his mouth a big machete at his side in the capacity of cook would make the most shiftless housekeeper gasp with horror 
i often wondered why he so persistently declared himself cocinero not marinero for he could hardly have been a greater failure in any calling than he was in that of chef among the most valued of my memories are some mental pictures of maestro which while i live i can never manage to forget i often shut my eyes and see him with streaming eyes stirring some fearful concoction over the little stove or again on his knees mixing dough for the leaden dumplings to be boiled in the pigtail stew which appeared at every meal we so often wished we had brought graham flour white flour does show the dirt so still another picture is maestro washing the tablecloth this was a piece of oil cloth originally white and maestro's method of washing it was to spread it on the deck pour water over it dance upon it in his bare feet to the accompaniment of some weird chant and finally hang it on the rail to dry no doubt after this proceeding he felt as self-satisfied as the most pompous and well-trained english butler in justice i must say that maestro did make one or two edible dishes he could boil the native vegetables yam tania and kush and he made very good cornmeal mush then after a long happy day on the canos we were always hungry and happiness and honest hunger overtook a multitude of sins besides whatever was lacking in maestro's bill of fare was compensated by the dried soups cocoa crackers and preserves from our own stores so we managed one way or another to keep the wolf from the door or perhaps more appropriately i should say the crocodile from the companionway as in two weeks the crew had consumed provisions planned by the captain to last a month the captain purchased a hundred pounds of beef from a dugout full of indians which passed us one day on the river this maestro salted plentifully and then hung up in the sun to cure long strips of it were suspended from the rigging from the boom and over the railing and whole entomological collections buzzed noisily about them for a few days we felt as though we were living in a butcher's shop and a butcher's shop in a tropical climate is a thing to be avoided at first we were inclined to resent this impromptu meat market it was not only disagreeable but it was in the way then came the thought suppose it were fish and we were so grateful to be spared that that we cheerfully submitted to a sloop draped with strips of meat as a house is festooned with similax at christmas as long as the larder was low the captain had known no peace of mind for fear his crew would desert us and the sloop so the purchase of such a delicacy as meat was a successful piece of strategy with all their faults there is among the venezuelans as among the mexicans a certain chivalry towards women and so i never felt the least alarm at being left alone on the sloop with the crew while the captain and my husband went off up the river the great dusky creole mate would put my stool in a shady spot and figuratively lay himself at my feet to serve me and maestro even pugnacious maestro would weave wonderful baskets for me of the roots of the mangrove baskets in nests of twelve each fitting snugly within the other and all gaily dyed with the venezuelan colors the pigments being extracted from the leaves or stems of unknown wild plants the time passed all too quickly with each day spent on the guarapiche river a gleaming stage with a setting of green trees brilliant flowers and fragrant orchids and an ever-changing plot with ever-changing actors 
of them all man was the least important there were populous villages of hoatzins and other wandering tribes of scarlet ibises and plovers herons much occupied with their unsocial and taciturn calling as fishermen stood silent and solitary in secluded pools with all this wild life the river teemed it was only with the rising and falling of the tide that man entered upon the scene and so quietly so much a part of nature that one hardly felt any difference between him and the forest folk in a silently swiftly moving curiara he would glide under the shadows of the overhanging mangroves sometimes the curiara would be a merchant vessel laden with ollas fruit etc with its destination maturin many miles away in the interior again its only occupant was a fisherman as silent as the herons themselves like a heron also he would station himself near a shady pool and sit all day motionless save for the changing of bait or the pulling in of a fish with the turning of the tide the line would be drawn up the fish covered with cool green leaves and the curiara would move away the bronze figure of its owner skillfully guiding it up the winding river occasionally the fisherman was accompanied by his squaw hardly to be distinguished from him and in the bow there was often the little naked figure of a child playing with a mite of a tame monkey or both sound asleep with their arms wrapped about each other all that these simple folk ask of life is one fish to eat another with which to buy cassava and a yard of cotton cloth in the brief tropical twilight we would hastily make preparations for the night spreading our air beds on deck hanging over them a white mosquito canopy and putting our electric flashlight and revolver at hand after the first two nights we had abandoned the cabin which had added to its other discomforts the fact that all the mosquitoes of the cano had selected it as their abode never were nights more beautiful than those which we spent on the deck of that little sloop and never was sleep more dreamless and peaceful in the darkness of early evening before the moon rose we would sit on deck munching sugar cane while the captain told us many a tale of his younger days when he was the prosperous owner of a schooner twice the size of the josefa jacinta and when smuggling brought adventure and yellow gold in abundance he was full of legend and superstition he told us of aged men and women both among the indians and the spaniards who he declared can by a peculiar whistle call together all the snakes in the vicinity and then by incantations so hypnotize them that they can be handled with impunity the owner of a hacienda will sometimes employ one of these charmers to call together the snakes which can then be killed the performers themselves however will never harm a snake he told many a story of black magic arts in which he firmly believed of sending to one's enemies scourges of rats or deadly diseases or departed spirits to make life unendurable finally the crew would roll up in their blankets in the bow the captain would disappear beneath his mosquitaro which would tremble and quake in the moonlight while he lay quiet in his hammock we would creep beneath our tent of netting to write up the last notes of the day or to listen to the sounds of the night from the bow would come a low murmur of voices in some weird chanting song until the captain roared out for all hands to go to sleep but he would not practice what he preached for he always talked himself to sleep sometimes in english or in spanish or again in creole while now and then he would mingle all three by day one would not have suspected philo the mate of being a person of romance 
but under the spell of the tropical moonlight he would often tell stories to the crew stories in which the heroine was always muy preciosa muy joven muy linda very charming very young and very beautiful she would set difficult tasks for her many lovers and her favorite suitor would be the one who most bravely bore himself under the tests i remember one tale to which the crew listened with awe in which one of the lovers was to lie all night in the cathedral stiff and still like a corpse another was to go to the same cathedral on the same night dressed in winding sheets like a ghost another was to represent the angel of death while a fourth impersonated the devil and a fifth was sent as an ordinary man of course none of them were to know of the others having been sent by the fair heroine of the story and of course the fortunate lover was the one who showed no terror and passed the night quietly in the church returning in the morning to claim his bride the story had its dramatic situations and philo made the most of them even maestro was moved to utter a low dios mio at the description of the entrance of the ghost the angel of death and finally the devil at which the poor corpse who had been shaking with fear through it all started up and fled in terror philo's story lost nothing in its telling and the superstitious crew went soberly to rest that night william and i lay as we so often did staring wonderingly out into the night the marvellous tropical night it was all like a dream the shining water of the cano the deep mysterious forest growing down to the water's edge the cries of unknown birds and beasts the impressive southern cross and the extraordinary brilliancy of the moonlight shining down upon the tiny deck of the josefa jacinta and upon us and the sleeping forms of its dusky crew we were sometimes awakened in the night by a sudden bright light in our faces it was maestro making a fire in which operation he used alarming quantities of kerosene to prepare the midnight repast for the crew who whenever they woke in the night would call loudly maestro cafe again the sound of an unusually heavy downpour of tropical rain on the tarpaulin overhead would awaken us and i would occasionally discover that my feet were in a puddle of water a shifting of beds to prevent our being drowned while we slept would invariably result in our feet being higher than our heads and because of the horde of mosquitoes which found their way in while the beds were being moved the rest of the night would be sleepless with the dawn came the roar of the howling monkeys a dainty tigana picked its way among the mud flats a flock of hervidores which being translated means boilers an appellation perhaps suggested by the notes of these black cuckoos bubbled away as cheerily as a bright kettle on a breakfast table and with these sounds of the dawn all our troubles of the night were forgotten after weeks of solitude in the mangrove jungles our prow was headed inland and a long night of silent drifting with the tide brought us to the mouth of the guanoco river here the captain and the unruly crew at dawn had their usual heated argument as to the management of the boat with the result that they nearly ran her aground one of the many narrow escapes which had happened so often as to create but little interest on our part guanoco was a river of bends around each one of which the captain assured us we would see the village but it was twilight before we turned the final bend and saw picturesque guanoco at the hour of vespertino a hill rising steep and blue with the silvery river at its foot and a cluster of little thatched huts perched one above another on the hillside it was delightful to feel solid ground under one's feet again and we could hardly get over our accustomed walk of 
three steps and overboard end of chapter three part one chapter three part two of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain here in our wilderness we found an unexpected home through the kindness of our cordial friends in trinidad mr eugene andre and mr ellis grell we had letters to the men in charge of the pitch lake at guanoco and it was to this great lake that the tiny settlement of guanoco owed its being as soon as we reached the wharf a young venezuelan came on board introducing himself as senor bernardo lugo y escobar one of the officials of the pitch lake company and explaining that mr grell had written him that we might possibly come to guanoco and that we were to be entertained at the headquarters for as long as we chose to stay mr lugo was most urgent in his hospitality and i knew well of what the sloop dinner would consist my astro and i would hold a perfectly futile consultation in which we would decide upon the only possible menu funche which is the venezuelan name for cornmeal mush dried pea soup and cocoa i must explain that the lack of variety in our larder was due to the fact that we had expected to be able to supplement our canned goods with fresh fish and game both of which proved difficult to obtain the latter because of the impossibility in this vast swamp of ever finding the game after it was shot the experience taught us the useful lesson which every camper and explorer learns sooner or later sometimes alas too late never to depend upon the game of the country but always to plan your provisions as if game did not exist then when one gets it it becomes an unexpected luxury but to return to my visions of a good dinner in the preparation of which i had no part or responsibility perhaps there would also be the luxury of a real bath i was roused from these attractive reflections by the voice of the captain politely refusing mr lugo's invitation for the night and saying that we would not go ashore until the next day whereupon i diplomatically remarked in english that mr lugo might not understand that i thought mr lugo's feelings would be hurt if we refused and as long as we were to go the next day and there was nothing to be gained by spending the night on the sloop why not gratify him by going at once and so it came about that in a few minutes more we were at headquarters as the house was quite invisible from the water we had imagined that we were to go to one of the thatched huts which we had seen from the river to our surprise around the base of the hill we found ourselves going up a pretty palm bordered walk which led to a low massive fort-like building in the broad open hall were comfortable rocking chairs in striking contrast to the sloop on which we had taken turns sitting on the one stool which the little craft possessed in the patio was a table laid for dinner with a big black trinidad negro bringing in steaming dishes there is no hospitality anywhere quite equal to that of the wilderness your host does not arrange your visit from the saturday to the monday fitting you in between a multitude of other engagements a wilderness welcome is as genial and inevitable as the tropical sunshine your visit is an event a milestone in the long road of lonely months of exile months which sometimes lengthen into years our very interesting friend mr eugene andre of trinidad told us that on one of his many orchid hunting expeditions he had chanced to land at a certain godforsaken little port on the west coast of colombia mr andre had wondered why the fare to this port from panama should be thirty dollars 
while the return passage was one hundred dollars the problem was solved after he had seen the port desolate barren inaccessible and fever and insect ridden one might be induced to pay thirty dollars to get there provided one knew not what manner of place it was but to get away one would pay any sum and gladly so it is that the little coastwise steamboat company calmly demands one hundred dollars to return the unfortunate traveller to panama and gets it at this forlorn spot there were stationed two young men i forget now in what capacity who for many months had not seen an intelligent human being into the empty monotony of their lives mr andre appeared it mattered not to those lonely young men who he was nor where he came from his welcome was stay with us stay a year or ten years we know all about each other we've talked about everything until there is nothing left to say we even know how much sugar we each like in our tea and who our great-grandmothers were and who we think wrote shakespeare's plays and we are so bored and so glad to see a new face thus it is that everywhere in the south american wilderness the english-speaking stranger is made welcome by his kind and we found guanoco no exception to this rule the pretty spanish greeting is the house is yours and during our stay at the pitch lake the headquarters became really ours we were given the best room the servants were put at our disposal and best of all we were perfectly free to come and go as we pleased and with everything done to facilitate our work all this we owed only to the instructions of mr ellis grell who was then financing the pitch lake company and to the kindness of mr lynch and mr stout two young west indians employed by the company we were tired that first night at guanoco the night before had been a hard one sailing all night long with the boom swinging back and forth and making impossible the hanging of our mosquito nets all through the night the captain and his crew worked down the narrow river the captain skillfully guided the sloop in the darkness of a moonless night following the line of the trees against the sky to mark the channel his commanding old voice rang from stern to bow the orders being there repeated by the mate to the sailors who were towing us and who paused in the wild melody which they chanted through that wonderful night to listen and obey it was a difficult and dangerous task the guiding of that sloop down so narrow and winding a river and even the unruly crew were obedient that night rendering the homage which in time of danger the ignorant unconsciously yield to a superior intelligence when we wondered at the captain's confidence he replied in his deep voice ah yes but i am old here and i know these conyos as i do my house and indeed here the curtain had risen upon his life and here it was likely to fall at the end of the last act when finally quite exhausted we had laid down upon the deck to sleep it was to fall into so profound a slumber that the mosquitoes devoured us unmolested in spite of our head nets which proved insufficient protection so it was that on the first night at guanoco we were very tired i sat lazily rocking in the cool evening breeze anointing my irritating bites with tango a preparation dependent upon faith cure for its healing properties and listening to the desultory talk of the young men the conversation was desultory however only so long as the venezuelan element of the household was present on this occasion that element was represented by the young mr lugo who had met us at the wharf after he had gone out on some errand the story of pitch lake was poured into our interested ears it was a story of intrigue and revolution 
and treason quite worthy of some medieval court first there was the passive venezuelan possession then the active enterprising money-making reign of the north american having as its natural result the jealousy of castro his oppression and injustice to the american company their rebellion in which they aided a great revolution against castro his revenge being to seize the property and put it in charge of venezuelans then came the departure of the american company which had done so much to develop the pitch lake followed by the arrival of the venezuelans appointed by the government men who knew just about as much about managing a great pitch lake as they did about guiding an aeroplane we were told of the time long before the advent of the lugo family when for weeks it was necessary to live always on the alert with revolver ever ready for defense when the very men with whom one sat down at table were capable of attempting to poison the food in order to free themselves of english-speaking men who might perhaps witness some ugly deed of treachery or defalcation this is the very long story in a nutshell we began then to understand why the house was so fort-like in structure it had been built to withstand assault only a few months before our visit it had been attacked by a party of revolutionists who hoped to find money in the company safe and five men had been killed and several injured this thrilling tale was told in the emotionless matter-of-fact way in which one might describe the moves in a game of chess from the moment our sloop sailed out of the harbor of port of spain the memory of the old familiar everyday world had seemed to grow dimmer and dimmer was it possible that there really was such a place as new york city with its clanging street cars its trains and subways and elevated roads thronged with people in mass all as much alike as an army of ants at that very hour the new york theatres were pouring their gay crowds into the brilliantly lighted streets how far away it all seemed down there in the great primeval forest of another continent we walked out under the stars to the edge of the forest black and mysterious teeming with the hidden life which we were so eager to study our world for the present was this forest wilderness stretching unbroken for mile upon mile with only the twinkling lights of guanoco to remind us of human habitations i dreamed that night of being stabbed in the back by a howling monkey while the safe of the pitch lake company was broken into by a band of shrieking macaws on the morning after our arrival at guanoco we sorrowfully said good-bye to the josefa jacinta as we watched her sail away we consoled ourselves by planning another and a longer trip on her a trip which never took place looking back after almost two years i realize that life can bring me few experiences more full of interest and charm than those days on a little venezuelan sloop exploring the mysterious untrodden mangroves how could you enjoy it i am often asked but the trifling discomforts were all in the day's work and more than compensated by the beauty and freedom and wonder of it all they served to make us know that it was not all a dream our days at guanoco began early and were full to overflowing of interest and work in the heat of midday we pressed flowers skinned the birds and wrote up our journals but in spite of being so busy we found time to get a little into the atmosphere of the human life here is the daily program at the lake of pitch this little outpost of humanity deep hidden in the tropical jungle at daybreak the group of sheds and thatched huts gives up a horde of trinidadian negroes great black fellows giants in strength children in mind 
amid a perfect medley of excitement and uproar breakfast is prepared we hear sounds which must mean at least the violent death of several and as one listens to the shrieks and groans the imagination easily supplies the terrible blows and struggles but a closer look only shows one of these great children down on his knees calling on everything which occurs to him or enters his vision to witness that he did not steal the sixpence from napoleon of which someone has accused him perhaps in jest yet all this is calmness compared to the later rush for the best cars to use in the day's work it would delight a sophomore's heart to see the melee but somehow all is straightened out and off go the hand trucks crawling along the rickety rails out over the lake like beads sliding along a string here a car has reached the end of the line the negro selects a place fairly clear of vegetation takes his broad adze and shears away the upper few inches of roots and mold then with deep swift strokes he outlines a big chunk of the shiny black gum cuts it loose and carries it on his head to his car so malleable is the pitch that by the time he has half filled the little iron truck the pitch has settled down and filled all interstices he trundles back the car and dumps it into one of the larger wooden trucks which will take it to guanoco he now receives a check which is redeemable for fifteen cents and the first link in the commercialization of the pitch is finished along the wavering line of temporary rails over which the hand cars are pushed back and forth are dozens of grave-like holes those nearer the railroad end are smooth edged and filled with soft pitch on which as yet no vegetation has taken root further along they are filled with water and still further we find them in the process of being excavated the men dig down until they have reached a depth of five or six feet and then start in a new place the hole is filled by the first rain water bugs fly to the little pool frogs lay their eggs in it queer fish wriggle their way to it and for a brief space it supports a considerable aquatic life then new soft pitch begins to ooze up and in a few more weeks the plug of viscid black gum has reached the level of the ground and the scar is soon healed over by a thin growth of grass in the rainy season the holes fill at once with water and indeed the whole plain is immersed to the depth of a foot or more then the men have to work up to their waists in water chopping beneath the surface prying the pieces loose with their toes and tearing the chunks off by taking long breaths and reaching far down for a few seconds at a time when we cross our asphalt streets and smell the tarry odor and feel its softness under a midsummer sun let us think of the strange lake in the tropical wilderness the table talk at headquarters was often most amusing torrents of spanish eloquence and gesticulations kept our english ears ever on the alert to follow the meaning and our sense of humor ever under strict control to preserve well-bred gravity when such statements were made as venezuela leads not only all the south american countries but all those of north america as well in literature art science and commerce when our general blank went to new york the greatest ovation ever paid any general in the world was given him new york remained amazed once only did i look amused and i have never quite recovered from my mortification at thus disgracing myself whatever the faults of the spaniard may be he never smiles when he is not intended to not even at the laughable mistakes which we foreigners make when we are learning his beautiful language i try to say in extenuation of my unseemly mirth that the spaniard has no sense of humor and that we should very much prefer having him laugh at our mistakes and letting us correct them but all to no purpose 
i know that i did not behave like a well-conducted venezolana and nothing can alter that fact the three venezuelans had been put in charge of the pitch lake because their sister's husband's niece had power in the court of castro among their regular duties they included singing airs from the operas reading don quixote and the caracas newspapers and playing dominoes they had provided themselves with elaborate costumes for the role they carried big revolvers and wore huge green and white cork helmets khaki riding clothes putties spurs and carried riding whips there was not a horse within fifty miles no horse even had there been one could penetrate the tiny forest trails about guanoco in the dancing sunlight and shadows and the orchid fragrant air it was hard to picture spilt blood and intrigue and treachery and harder still to prophesy the sad times that were to come upon guanoco yet while we were there the air teemed with revolutionary rumors the jefe civil as the chief magistrate was called was off day after day investigating first one suspicion and then another returning utterly spent with the exhaustion of unresting days and nights upon the trail revolutionists had attempted to land guns on the nearby coast there had been a skirmish and several men had been killed all the available guns and ammunition were gotten together and every night the doors were barred securely for what the revolutionists chiefly needed was money and should there be an uprising in northeastern venezuela the pitch lake headquarters would be the first point of attack it was in charge of castro sympathizers there might be large sums of money in the company safe and it was practically unprotected in the meantime diplomatic relations between our united states and venezuela had been severed and one morning a united states battleship was discovered lying quietly in the harbor of la guayra the numbers of la constitucional a month old when they reached us were beginning to talk of war and to boast the ease with which venezuela would erase the united states of america from the face of the globe bitter things were said about the sister republic in the north and there we were living on the bone of contention itself it was about this time that i began to see the advisability of being more than ordinarily civil and so it happened that i was led into playing cards for the first and only time for money and that on a sunday we had been working almost incessantly and i had begun to feel that even if it was to mr grell that we were indebted for the hospitality it was not quite nice for us to appear only at feeding time particularly as our long days out of doors gave us such appalling appetites so on this occasion when i was asked to make a fourth at cards i saw no way out of it moreover the battleship lay in the harbor of la guayra and my countrymen were in sad disfavor in venezuela william had ignominiously deserted and gone to bed so there was only one sleepy little woman left to uphold the honor of a great nation the game was siete y media seven and a half i forget the rules now i only remember that they seemed very intricate as explained to me in spanish fortunately for me the stakes were low but i steadily lost all the time grano por grano la gallina come quoted mr lugo grain by grain the hen eats later he remarked how he hated to win from the senorita but the senorita observed that he hated it much as the famous walrus wept for the oysters while he sorted out those of the largest size holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes i was woefully tired and sleepy i did not at all know the etiquette of gambling and i thought the loser must not be a quitter even if the extent of her losses was only dos reales or twenty-five cents 
so i played on until at midnight the game was declared over it is well that virtue is its own reward as it has no other for i was told the next morning by a husband who had had a perfectly good night's sleep that i was a very foolish person indeed to sit up playing cards with those men and that the loser could always stop it was the winner who must not propose it the negroes from the pitch lake always came down on saturday nights and serenaded us with wild creole airs and at the sound of the quaterns and violins huge hairy tarantulas would come forth from their hiding places in our rooms and creep briskly here and there over walls and floor we were greatly interested in this effect of the vibrations of sound but we never bothered the great creatures in their strange tarantelles and they paid no attention to us the venomous effect of the bites of all these eight or hundred legged beings is greatly exaggerated and there is absolutely no serious danger to a healthy person with good red blood in his veins in some of the half-starved rum-drinking natives the scratch of a pin would induce blood poisoning labor was easily secured in guanoco the morning after our arrival we expressed a wish to employ a boy to act as attendant carrying camera gun butterfly net etc when we went on our long tramps one of the young men at headquarters went to the door and called muchacho and at once a small boy appeared i should have judged his age to be between eleven and twelve but he himself did not know he said his grandmother was keeping his age a charming idea is that venezuelan custom of having some responsible member of the family keep all the ages think of being able to say truthfully that you really do not know how old you are but then a venezuelan woman never confesses to more than twenty-seven no matter what may have been the flight of time our small servant's name proved to be maximiliano romero and with supreme self-possession boldly spitting to the right and left he professed himself willing to enter our service like a true venezuelan he used expectoration to punctuate all his remarks what a quaint little figure he was topped by a huge straw hat with a high peaked crown the hat the work of the little brown hands of max himself for he was a hat maker by profession his face was alert but very grave he rarely smiled but when he did it was in no half-hearted way but with the abandon of childish glee i found myself devoting a good deal of valuable time to trying to bring into being that charming smile of maximiliano's one never knew just what would touch the right chord once he went off into gales of merriment at the escape of a lizard which we were trying to photograph he always saw the funny side of our mishaps max showed plainly in what esteem he held naturalists the first day he went out with us he was neatly dressed in dark blue jeans when he appeared on the second morning we did not recognize him a small ragamuffin stood before us stamping like a pony to drive away the flies which hovered about his ankles his clothes were a mass of rags it was impossible to say what had been the original color or material max had taken our measure and decided that people who tramped through the bush as we did were not worthy of anything better than rags sometimes in the jungle we would meet indian women who living far in the interior were on their way to guanoco to buy machetes fish hooks and other articles of civilization they would always stop and make friends with us with childlike curiosity asking where we came from and why we wanted birds and lizards and butterflies and murmuring the words dear to every woman's heart in all lands que jovencita which literally translated is what a little young thing very simple-hearted are these poor indian women and so hard are their lives 
that at a very early age do they cease to be jovencita we would often meet the wandering tribes of guarauno indians who live nearly always upon the march carrying all their worldly possessions upon their backs and sleeping wherever night happens to find them they very rarely knew even a word of spanish and shunned any intercourse with strangers scorning the inventions of civilization and using the poisoned arrows of their ancestors one sunday morning one of the laborers at the nearby pitch lake bearing the pious name of jose de jesus zamoro came into headquarters to invite us to a dance that afternoon at his house the house of zamoro had nothing particularly to recommend it as a ballroom for the floor was of dirt the ceiling low and the walls windowless but it was crowded the air stifling and the dancers dripping with perspiration the music was wild and strange the man who shook the maracas an instrument consisting of two gourds filled with dried seeds which is shaken in time to the music often breaking into a weird song making up the words as he went along with some joke about each dancer as the songster's zeal waxed high he described himself as being so great that where he stood the earth trembled between dances the lady's last partners were supposed to take them into the next room where drinks were for sale this was the explanation of zamoro's zeal for dances music and dance hall were free but a substantial profit came from the drinks the ball gowns had but one beauty that of originality there was always an unfortunate hiatus between bodices and skirts which was partially concealed by the long straight black hair which hung down the backs of the women the shoes were in a piteous condition never the right size very seldom mates and not infrequently both were for the same foot but all the skirts had trains and all the ears bore earrings we were told that these women often danced all day and all night until they became perfectly dazed their feet moving mechanically in time to the music of the national dance the jaropa which is a cross between a clog dance and a waltz we saw dancing the women whose curiara had so narrowly escaped a fatal collision with our sloop in the guarapiche the captain had said they were leaving maturin to operate some speculation in guanoco perhaps even to find husbands and here among so many men for the population of guanoco was chiefly composed of men employed at the lake surely there was hope even for adventuresses so black and uncouth as these here also we met one of guanoco's most amusing characters a big black trinidad negro he was full of the superiority of one who had seen the world for he had once been to england as stateroom steward on one of the big steamers he now dropped his h's called his wife lady mckay and on sundays wore a monocle it was twilight as we walked home through the little settlement and one of the hut's two little naked babies were playing rock -a in the great curved sheaths which protect the blossom of the moriche or eta palm at another a child came out and sang a little spanish song for us all about her sins and the confession she must make to the priest the refrain being mi penitencia mi penitencia and she sang it with her little hands clasped and her head devoutly bowed a few coins made the wee penitent superlatively happy her mother must have taught her the song for in guanoco there was no priest no school no doctor the two young west indians at headquarters neither much more than twenty years old officiated at all funerals being catholic or protestant in spanish or english as the case demanded they prescribed for all the diseases from the prevalent fever to the woman who was suffering greatly but could give no more definite description of her trouble than that she had a pain that walked 
i could never understand the fever so common at guanoco for i never knew a place more free from mosquitoes and from insects of every description we were continually in the sun and often in the rain yet we both kept in perfect health the women of the village had converted a small open shed into a chapel with an altar on which were all the offerings they could make a few candles some bits of gilt paper and tinsel a rude wooden cross and a wretched little chromo of the virgin here as we passed we saw the women kneeling for where else could they take their troubles at last our venezuelan experiences were a thing of the past and we were homeward bound leaving behind us the dear delightful never know what's going to happen life and realizing as our ship cut her way through the countless knots of dashing waves that as maximiliano had said with a shake of his head when we laughingly asked him if he did not want to go with us está tan lejos it is so far much has happened at guanoco since the days of our visit very soon after our departure castro fearing the smouldering revolutionary plots in trinidad ordered all the ports of eastern venezuela closed later came the deadly bubonic plague sealing for many months all the ports of the unfortunate country then indeed trouble descended upon poor little guanoco it was an essentially non-agricultural part of the country the one industry had been the digging of pitch the company's boat plying between guanoco and trinidad having brought all necessary supplies now with all communication cut off the people were in a piteous condition in the revolution of the wheel of fate which whirls so rapidly in venezuela the lugo family had been deposed and a new venezuelan administrator appointed in their place having known the lugos i like to think that they would have been less heartless than their successor who so the report goes sold what supplies there were to the starving people at cruelly exorbitant prices no matter how much one may love nature one cannot help feeling how unmoved she is in the face of suffering human beings might starve and sicken and die at guanoco but the sunshine would be just as warm and glowing and the wind in the palm trees just as musical as ever with the cutting off of communication between venezuela and trinidad captain trujillo's occupation was gone the josefa jacinta no longer plied busily back and forth between port of spain and maturin driving a brisk trade in hammocks groceries and hides and so at last she passed from the possession of captain trujillo to that of some more prosperous trader who could afford to wait for the reopening of commerce for a year our old captain watched his little vessel guided out of the harbor of port of spain with a strange hand at the helm and a strange voice in command then one day she sailed away never to return but to be run aground and lost on a desolate and lonely part of the venezuelan coast what became of her new captain and crew we never heard we knew only that the josefa jacinta was lost and that we could never sail her again except on dream canos in a phantom wilderness end of chapter three chapter four part one of our search for a wilderness by mary blair Beebe this librivox recording is in the public domain georgetown another year has slipped past and again we are southward bound toward that mecca the tropics which never ceases to call us the time is the fifteenth of february nineteen o nine the place the royal dutch mail steamship Copenhagen. nine days out from new york at three o'clock in the morning we are roused suddenly from sleep 
by a gentle roaring in our ears when we have gained partial consciousness we realize that it is the basso profundo whisper of good captain hosnoot summoning us to the bridge we ask no questions for we have learned that the voice of the genial dutchman means something worth while whether it is raised in a thunderous roar of hofmeister or as now in gentler aspects wrapped in flapping blankets we climb the steep ladder to the bridge there to enjoy for half an hour a most wondrous display of phosphorescence even excelling that visible in the bay of fundy the captain in all his world-wide seafaring has never seen anything to equal it we are only a short distance off the shore of british guiana and the ocean is thick with sediment from the rivers the sky is overcast and no light comes from the moon and stars and yet the whole sea is plainly visible the horizon glows with a dull yellow flare against the jet black sky and the myriad foam caps shimmer as with brighter flames the quenching of these in the opaque water gives a vivid impression of an enormous conflagration half hidden behind billows of smoke at daybreak georgetown is in sight a low flat line of wharfs with a background of galvanized tin roofs and tall bending palm trees never was a fairyland set in so prosaic a frame with what mingled feelings our little ship's family lean on the rail and scan the shore to some the thought comes of the miracles of yellow gold and precious stones hidden deep beneath the primitive forests to other sea-weary travellers the stability of the shore appeals most while we too watch for the first hint of bird life our desire is gratified before that of any of the others for over the water there comes the first morning call of the great yellow tyrant kiskadi bringing a hundred memories of the tropics as we steam slowly up to the wharf a small flock of gray-breasted martins twitters above our heads a black vulture swings over the tin roofs the jubilant song of the guiana house wren reaches our ear and our second search has begun to those who seek for wildernesses there is not much of interest in georgetown save the museum and the botanical garden yet there is no doubt that the city is one of the most attractive in the tropics and when the inhabitants are aroused to a sense of the opportunities which they are throwing away it will become a famous tourist resort awakening the country to new life and bringing shekels to the coffers of its merchants hotels and mosquitoes are the two keys to the situation the one to be acquired the other banished when this is done the many popular winter resorts will be hard put to it to retain their lucrative migrants from the north the inhabitants of georgetown have one regrettable failing an unreasoning fear and dread of their own country they cling to their narrow strip of coastal territory where they work and play live and die many of them without ever having been five miles away from the sea the majority of the inhabitants of french guiana are convicts chained for life to their prisons here the good people of british guiana bind themselves with imaginary bonds and picture their wonderful land as teeming with serpents and heaven knows what other terrors another unfortunate failing is the firm conviction of some of the influential citizens that there is no truth in the mosquito theory as a cause of malaria and yellow fever a distinguished english scientist recently sent to investigate yellow fever in barbados and british guiana was holding up as an example to the citizens of georgetown the barbadian custom of keeping fishes in their water cisterns explaining that the fishes devoured the mosquito larvae 
and thus kept down the number of mosquitoes a barbadian who chanced to be in the audience interrupted the scientist by saying oh but that is not the reason they put fishes in the cisterns it is to make sure the water has not been poisoned by some enemy until the mosquito is exterminated in georgetown the tourist will prefer to go elsewhere even though that be to a less beautiful spot we were advised to spend all our time in georgetown where we might drink pink swizzles than which no worse medicine exists or read in the cool library or study the natural history of the country impaled on pins or stuffed with cotton both of which are improving occupations but can be done quite as well in new york every moment spent in streets of human making seemed sacrilege when the real wilderness the wilderness of waterton of schaumburg and of off im thurn beckoned us just beyond armed with proper letters of introduction and travelling in the name of science one is treated with all courtesy by guiana officials the customs gave no trouble save that one pays a deposit of twelve per cent on cameras guns and cartridges we were glad to find that the most difficult privilege to obtain is a permit to collect birds and the very stringent laws in this respect are an honor to the governor and his colonial officials thanks to the absence of the plume and general millinery hunter the game hog and the wholesale collector birds are abundant and tame we were in the colony just two months and shot only about one hundred specimens all of which were secured because of some special interest we brought home some two hundred and eighty live birds which are now housed in the new york zoological park once off the single wharf lined business street of georgetown one is instantly struck by the beauty of the place green trees flowering vines and shrubs are everywhere half hiding the ugly tropical architecture the streets are all wide some with gravel walks down the center shaded with the graceful salmon trees others with central trenches filled with the beautiful victoria regia here a native two species of big tyrant flycatchers are the english sparrows of the city and white-breasted robins palm and silver-beaked tanagers perch on the limbs of trees at one's very window although we were anxious to start on our first expedition into the bush as the primeval forests of the interior are called yet a week passes very pleasantly in the city itself the street life is a passing pageant full of interest and of the charm of novelty for the northerner carriages roll past in which sit very correctly dressed and typical english women still others are filled with creoles some to all appearances perfectly white others in which the infusion of negro blood is very apparent many of the creole women have a certain languid beauty and a good deal of grace and self-possession the passing of the liveried carriage of the governor causes a ripple of excitement it is five o'clock the fashionable hour for driving and all these equipages are bound for the sea wall where the occupants sit and listen to an excellent band enjoy the sea breeze and chat with their neighbors about the all-important happenings of the social set of georgetown while the pale-faced children dig in the sand or run shrieking with glee from an incoming wave just as do their rosy contemporaries of the north another picture is the coolie in his loose white garments and turban and his sinewy bare brown legs he gazes at you as calmly and as unmoved as though you were not even the lowest coolie bears about him this unconscious dignity of an ancient race and a civilization that was old when we were but beginning 
the coolie women make a vivid spot of color in our pageant like some glowing tropical flower many of them are beautiful in feature and all are graceful in bearing there never were women who so perfectly understood the art of walking they swing along erect and lithe with a springing step and perfect coordination of every muscle their heavy bracelets and anklets tinkle musically as they move their gay red and yellow and blue scarfs flutter in the breeze the poise of their bodies reflects the perfect calm and repose of their smooth brown faces what an antithesis these are to the ponderous old black women who are striding along with bedraggled skirts gathered up in a roll around their massive waists they are untidy and slatternly in dress heavy and awkward in movement in comparison with the straight slim coolie women they are full of loud laughter and talk and song at every street corner they gather in friendly jovial groups while the coolie women are strangely silent and reserved no wonder that these two races so hate and scorn one another for in temperament they are as far apart as the poles the british guiana blacks were to us an unending source of interest and amusement they were always courteous and kind and most original even when swearing at each other their manner was always polite and each anathema ended with a civil sir their dialect was at first very difficult to understand but when our ears became familiar with it we found it singularly attractive all the a's are broad even in such words as bad and man while the intonation is indescribable the verbs in a sentence being always emphasized and given a slight rising inflection as for example i have been to berbice an interrogation is often not at all indicated by the form of a question but merely by the rising inflection as these are nice the general effect of their speech is very musical and distinctive intonation always the irrepressible spirit of the black rises serenely above all the vicissitudes of life a black woman from arakaka was sentenced to a month in jail upon her return she was welcomed by a crowd of friends all eager to hear something of that mysterious jail to which none of them were sure they might not some day go to their questions how was it how was it the heroine of the occasion replied with great dignity a child they see i was a lady and they didn't give me the same work as the other prisoners later on a trip down the river the same woman meeting the magistrate who had sentenced her proudly remarked now i travel by myself her only previous experience in traveling having been under the escort of the police many of the blacks have far advanced cases of elephantitis in a five minutes walk one will see a half dozen examples of this deadly disease but it takes more than elephantitis or jail to sadden the volatile spirits of the negro cosmopolitan as is the street pageant of georgetown it is however not so much so as that of port of spain the coolies are even more numerous there than here and in addition to the same sort of english and negro life there is also an american spanish and french element one hears on all sides the pretty french patois and the musical spanish of the south american is a constant delight this large spanish and french population make port of spain a decidedly catholic city and priests and nuns in unfamiliar garbs are always a part of the picture it is very hard for us northerners to realize that the course of a tropical day is much the same the year around here is a georgetown day as we found it in february at five thirty a m it is still dark 
and the only sound is an occasional raucous crow from the chanticleer soon a subdued murmur of sound is heard and this remains unchanged in volume for some time then the sunrise gun booms in the distance a kiskadee shrieks just outside our window a score of others answer him church chimes ring out noisy coolie carts rattle past negroes sing dogs bark an excellent brass band strikes up a two-step and amid all this pandemonium of sound the sun literally leaps above the horizon and instantly fills the world with brilliant color the scene changes like magic there is no dawn or dusk night gives place to day without intermission the temperature morning and evening is about seventy six degrees woven amid all the harsh cries of kiskadees and tanagers is heard the sweet warbling of the little house wrens reminding us of our singers of the north and bubbling over with the same crisp vocal vitality which we hear in early spring in our own country like the morning the tropical day itself is one of extremes the morning dawns fresh and bracing until nine o'clock one walks briskly breathes deeply and can hardly realize that he is at sea level within seven degrees of the equator it is april and may in the calendar of one's feelings then for an hour or two june reigns and finally from eleven to five o'clock in the afternoon it is hot sultry august in the shade however it is always comfortable from three o'clock on we experience the coolness of october and until darkness shuts suddenly down about half past six like the snuffing out of a candle the temperature is perfect the nights are delightfully cool mosquitoes are bad only in the houses and at night one's net is a protection the humidity is high but it is far more bearable than that of a summer in new york city contrary to our visual idea of the tropics the manner of rain in the tropics is peculiar the atmosphere may be ablaze with brilliant sunshine when a slight haze appears in the air and suddenly one realizes that a fine gentle rain is falling this may cease as imperceptibly as it began or increase to a terrific downpour to give place perhaps a few minutes later to the clear tropic glare again end of part one of chapter four part two of chapter four of our search for a wilderness by mary lair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain before taking leave of georgetown we must mention the three chief points of attraction the sea wall comes first and as we have said a most pleasant custom of the natives is to drive there in late afternoon and sit in their carriages the concrete breakwater is of vital importance to the town itself as a portion of the streets are below sea level the broad summit forms a mile or more of promenade with a sandy beach on one side lapped with waves which strive ever to break but cannot because of the thick sediment which they hold in suspense on the other side a double row of tall graceful palms adds a touch of tropical beauty the residences near the sea wall are the coolest and most pleasant in the town and are practically free from mosquitoes we spent more than one delightful evening in the garden at kitty villa as the guests of our charming american friends mr and mrs howell from the open veranda like rooms one may watch the yellow orioles the brown-breasted pygmy grosbeaks the anis and kiskadees going to roost just before dusk scores of the small black vultures appear flying singly 
or in twos and threes low over the trees and palms westward to some general roost about this time the bats and the lightning bugs arrive large numbers of very tiny bats hawking about after insects and several large fruit eaters with wings spreading almost two feet across these haunt the fruit-laden sapadillo trees and as the method of feeding of these curious creatures does not seem to be generally known we watch it with interest one of the big fellows flits here and there nipping first one fruit and then another at last when a sweet or fully ripe one is found the bat swoops up to it alights head downward and half enveloping it with its wings bites away frantically for two or three seconds and then dashes off this is repeated until darkness settles down but never does the wary bat linger over his feast in the north the sight of a single bat darting along on his eccentric way is not uncommon but here we were soon to become accustomed to the sight of scores some pursuing insects or feeding on fruits or waiting and watching for a chance to drink the blood of men and animals more than twenty-five species have been found here within a few miles of the coast small owls and nocturnal insectivorous birds are somewhat rare and thus the bats have few foes and little competition in their aerial life late in the evening as we drive slowly homeward from the sea wall we discover another interesting microcosm of the tropics the road is well lighted with arc lamps sources of irresistible attraction to numberless insects many of which drop stunned to the earth beneath some genius among the georgetown toads has discovered this fact and passed the word along until now one finds a circle of expectant amphibians squatted beneath each arc light with eyes and hopes lifted to the shining globe overhead now and then an unfortunate insect falls within the magic circle when a toad leaps lazily forward and devours the morsel with one lightning-like flick of the tongue many of these toads bufo agua are enormous fellows a good hatful standing fully eight inches from their pudgy toes to their staring eyes all comical dignified fat and sluggish barely hopping aside in time to avoid the horse and carriage to a visiting naturalist the museum is the place of greatest interest and although the animals and birds are faded and poorly mounted yet they are representative of the fauna of the country and are hence of great value in accustoming one's eyes to the strange forms of life the present curator mr james rodway did everything in his power to aid us and we were indebted to him for many kindnesses although he is primarily a botanist entomology occupies his attention at present and the supply of species of the various orders of insects living in this region seems well nigh inexhaustible mr rodway is a good example of the healthfulness of british guiana for he has lived there thirty-nine years and has been ill only one day he accounts for this by his teetotalism but perhaps the next person we meet will inform us that a half dozen swizzles a day are absolutely necessary to keep the breath of life within the body the botanical gardens under the able direction of professor j b harrison are a great credit to the colony with beautiful vistas of palms and ornamental shrubs they combine smooth expanses of green lawns a rare feature in a tropical landscape ponds and ditches are filled with victoria regia and lotus save one where a number of manatees keep the aquatic vegetation cropped close a wonderful palm was in blossom at the time of our visit a taliput 
with a mass of bloom twelve feet in height which had begun to flower the month before governor hodgson and professor harrison gave us the freedom of the garden and placed at our disposal five circular aviaries which proved of an inestimable value in housing the living birds which we were able to secure here mr lee s crandall our assistant made his trapping headquarters after our return from our first inland expedition and here we spent many afternoons among the fields and bypaths we soon found that bird trapping in the tropics is a task beset by many difficulties the extreme heat between the hours of ten and four o'clock make even the tackiest lime nearly as thin as water and hardly capable of holding even the diminutive doctor bird as the natives call the hummingbirds the call birds which are confined in very small cages or cribs cannot endure the high temperature under these conditions and soon succumb if left out in the sun operations therefore must be confined to the few hours immediately following sunrise and preceding sunset another feature very trying to the bird catcher is the habit which most of the birds have of going singly or in pairs a few of the icterine birds such as the yellow-headed blackbird cowbird little boat-tailed grackle and most of the caciques feed mostly in flocks sometimes of great size in the deep bush of the interior it is the habit of birds of many species to search together for food following a set route and keeping closely to their time schedule but ordinary call birds and setups are not for these this gregarious habit among widely varying birds is however at times a great aid to the trapper a cage containing a yellow-bellied caliste was one day placed in a tree about twenty feet high and limed twigs arranged on neighboring branches in two hours in the morning two specimens of the same species three blue tanagers two black-faced calistes two tuatuas or brown-breasted pygmy grosbeaks and one yellow oriole were taken the various species of tanagers and orioles are much more gregarious in feeding habits than the finches hence the variety caught the tua tuas were purely accidental visitors the finches can rarely be taken by a call bird not of the same species the black or coolie boy who makes his living at catching birds at tuppence each sets out at daylight with his two or three call birds in their cribs arranged on a stick arrived at some secluded spot where he has heard the song of an intended victim he sets his call birds on upright sticks of two or three feet in length and places on the top of each cage a strong wire heavily smeared with the gum of the sapadillo this wire is very carefully twisted so that it cannot by any possibility become loosened this is of course contrary to the ethics of all good bird catchers for if the bird falls to the ground with its stick it is much more certain to be secured and less liable to injure itself however this is british guiana having made his setup the youth steals softly back and conceals himself a short distance away as soon as left to themselves the birds if they be experienced commence their song soon an answering call is heard instantly the decoys cease their song and send forth their sharp call notes soon the curious stranger appears perhaps a fine adult male full of eagerness for a battle if this be the case the songs are again resumed and the climax of the concert is almost certain to be the capture of the challenger if the visitor be a coy female the seductive call notes are continued and though the time required may be greater she is nearly as certain to be captured 
Callow youngsters out for their first exploring trip are of course the easiest victims but when the trapper has taken a bird or two from this locality he must move on or give up for the day for he will take no more the trapping methods of these people are of course very primitive they know nothing of clap nets they laugh at the idea of catching birds with an owl as practiced successfully in the north a black boy will bend his gummed wire securely on a likely twig and lie all day on his back in the shade hoping that a bird may light on it birds to whose capture they are not equal are very apt to be licked stunned by a bullet from a slingshot and foisted on the unwary purchaser these unfortunates of course rarely live more than a day or two no regard is shown for nesting birds or nestlings caciques and orioles are captured by adjusting a string about the mouth of the long pendulous nest and closing it tightly when the bird has entered to hover its eggs in two instances a black boy was seen to capture the female from her nest by creeping up and dropping his hat over her some use is made of primitive trap cages which are baited with plantain or sliced mangoes tanagers or sackies and various orioles are taken in this manner these simple people have of course no knowledge whatever of proper food for insectivorous or frugivorous birds various fruits preferably plantain are used and it is truly surprising how long some individuals will survive on this too acid food mr howie king government agent of the northwest district actually kept a specimen of the yellow oriole for over seven years on a strictly fruit diet birds and other creatures were very abundant and tame in the botanical gardens guiana green herons or shy pooks as the coolies call them spur-winged jacanas and gainules walked here and there the latter leading their dark-hued young over the regia pads small crocodiles basked half out of the water none over three feet in length as abundant as turtles in a northern mill pond several huge water buffalo imported from the east indies looked strangely out of place in this hemisphere butterflies were scarce although a great variety of flowers were in profusion everywhere april seems to be the height of the breeding season for many birds in one tree we found two wasps nests and nests with eggs or young of the following six species of birds the red-winged ground dove the great and lesser kiskadees white-shouldered ground flycatcher or cotton bird gray toady flycatcher or pipituri and cynercus picard chestnut cuckoos of two species all four kiskadees caracaras black-faced tanagers or bucktown sackies elaneus and other flycatchers are a few among many birds which we were sure of seeing on every walk while anise both great and small were everywhere the botanical gardens are ideal for experimental botanical work and sugarcane in scores of varieties is being kept under observation it is hard to believe that the delicate grass which we see springing up in the ditched fields will grow into the lofty and waving stalks of sugarcane. It is exceedingly variable and should afford excellent material for experimental study. The original yellow-stalked cane develops red and purple streaks in many combinations, due apparently to difference in soils. Cane sent to Louisiana will, within 12 years, produce much larger nodes owing to the plant having to fruit in six months instead of eleven or twelve the stalk however does not gain correspondingly in diameter 
so there is no increase in sugar capacity. Tropical plants can, in many cases, adapt themselves to shorter northern summers, but temperate perennials soon die in the tropics from exhaustion, lacking their annual period of rest. The climatic conditions along the coast of British Guiana are peculiar in that they simulate conditions usually existing at an altitude of two or three thousand feet. One result of this is seen in the flourishing tree ferns planted in the botanical gardens. Insects were not particularly abundant in Georgetown, that is for a tropical country. One day, Mr. Rodway, with his accustomed kindness, brought us two very interesting chrysalids of the swallow-tailed butterfly, Papilio polydamus, illustrating the remarkable color variation in this species. Both were found in his yard, a few feet from each other, one suspended among green leaves and the other on a wooden stairway, which was painted a brick red. One of the chrysalids was leaf green in color, while the other was brown with brick red trimmings. There was one remarkable exception to the scarcity of insects in Georgetown. Late in February, a moth-like homopterous insect, Poiscilloptera phaleonoides, was present in enormous numbers on the salmon trees, which line many of the streets. The largest individuals had wings almost an inch in length of a light cream color covered for about half their expanse with two masses of black dots. These were the males. The females were wingless and their bodies were covered with a long dense cottony secretion. The eggs and larvae which lined thousands of the twigs were also protected by this white material. One could hardly walk without crushing these insects, so numerous were they. The only birds we observed feeding on them were anis and domestic fowls. The middle of April found these insects as abundant as ever, still hatching in myriads, but by the 22nd of the month the broods on the main streets seemed to be diminishing although the hordes infesting the trees at the entrance of the botanical gardens were on the increase. Noticing that there seemed to be interesting nodes of variation in the number and patterns of the dots on the wings of the males, we set a coolie boy to gathering them for future study, and he soon had a thousand or more in a jar of alcohol. End of chapter 4